Hello, my name is Jeff. This is 2A Self-Defense Law. What we do is we help people understand the law of self-defense in the simplest terms possible. We take the fear out of getting it wrong. What we are doing today is I'm going to let you decide. This is a case that started about two years ago and ended not so long ago. And we got the start of it. We got the conclusion. We're going to test your skills and I'm going to be showing you exactly what the information that you're going to need to know to decide if this was a self-defense case or a murder case okay as you can see here the end of it murder charge against rochester man dismissed in a 2018 fender bender in order for you to get a better overall understanding of what is going on here is a news clip all of the evidence has now been presented in the trial of 26-year-old Alexander Weiss. Weiss faces one count of second-degree murder in the shooting death of 17-year-old Mohammed Rahim after a minor car crash. Today, Weiss took the stand in his own defense. ABC6 News reporter Talia Milovitz was in court and joins us in studio now. Talia? That's right. Weiss did take the stand today, but before he did, a forensic scientist with the BCA testified about the physical evidence. She received a swab from Weiss's face where he claims he was spit on by Rahim, but the only DNA found on the swab belonged to Weiss himself. Then it was Weiss's turn to take the stand. He described how after a minor car collision the morning of January 14, 2018, he and a passenger in the car Rahim was driving got out. Weiss said the passenger was yelling threats like all I'll make you pay and I'll kill you. He said he felt extremely frightened, so he grabbed his phone and gum, gun from his car, which was still running, with the passenger door open. Weiss said when he turned around, the passenger was right there, threatening him. Weiss said the passenger became erratic, so he held the gun at his side and yelled, Stop, I have a gun. He says that's when Rahim got out of the car and walked toward him. Weiss claimed Rahim continued threatening him and reached for his gun, making contact. That's when he said he shot Rahim once in the torso, adding he was devastated when he learned during questioning by police that Rahim had died. Weiss said he knew the hollow point bullets he used were designed to expand on impact to cause maximum maximum damage to a human being. During his cross-examination, Weiss said he had reason to fear the other passengers in Rahim's car. In addition to the passenger that confronted Weiss, there were two female teenagers in the back seat of the car Rahim was driving. Weiss said he had a vision of being knocked out by Rahim or the passenger and that the girls would kick him while he was on the ground. He said during firearm training, he was taught to think about all future possibilities and that he was one against four. The trial will reconvene at 1 p.m. Monday when the judge will make his final instructions and the attorneys will give their closing arguments. Stay with ABC6 for the latest. Back to you. Now we're going to go over the, some of the facts in the case. What you just listened to was a narrative of what Alexander Weiss said on the stand. We're going to be getting into the case a little bit more and then we're going to go over innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonless give you a couple of facts to see if those uh, standards apply to Alexander Weiss. And remember, uh, we'll get to it when we get to it. I'm going to be taking most of the verbiage out of CCW Safe's Sean Vincent's article about this case. I've been following this case since it happened um, January of 2018 uh, because of the, there was a very specific thing that was mentioned in the criminal complaint and I'll just it's it's I'll just get into that part of it right now where he had a bumper sticker on his car that said gun control is hitting your target and that was a prominent feature of Andrew, uh, Alexander Weiss's intent it, what is your intent if you have that saying on your car that's really what interests me in, in this in this case, and it really played out in the courtroom where the prosecutor went down the road saying this guy is a little bit of trigger happy, and he presented it as that narrative to the jury. But anyway, Sean Vincent does a very good job of uh, analysis, uh, giving his analysis to what the case is, so we're just going to be using his reference to it. I can get a lot of bunch of raw data, but this saves me hours of putting stuff together for you. 
a big part of this case was um, a duty to retreat case, and we're going to go over it. And this really applies to, even though that Minnesota is a duty to retreat case, and this, this happened in January 2018 in Rochester, Minnesota, there are some conditions that apply even if you don't live in a standard ground state. All right. Uh, the 25 year old Alexander Weiss was on his way from to referee a basketball tournament in Cannon Falls, Minnesota in January of 2018 when he witnessed a silver Chevy Cavalier skid sideways through the intersection and smash into the curb. Weiss drove past the car and pulled over and intent to offering help, but before he had a chance, the driver of the Chevy um, revved his engine and smashed pretty forcefully into his vehicle. Weiss got out of the car to deal with the aftermath of the collision. And just to let you know that court testimony of the passenger, we'll get into the passenger's name here shortly, said that they were screwing around on snowy streets. And that's what young kids do in the state of Minnesota when you want to have a little fun with two girls in the back seat. So it's going to be two boys in the front and two girls in the back. A passenger emerged from the car, uh, Nod Ducart. He was yelling, according to the report by the Post Bulletin. West testified that Ducart has had his, sh his shoulders up and his fists balled. Weiss told jurors that Ducart accused him of causing a crash, and w when, when, when Weiss threatened to call the police, Ducart threatened to kill him. Weiss went back to his still running car and retrieved his cell phone and took his Glock pistol from the glove compartment and slid it into his jacket pocket. Then he engaged Ducard. I believe it's a crime if you leave, Weiss said in an effort to justify his choice to continue the uh, confrontation. We'll be going over this, that he was confronted, he left, and then he returned with a gun. All right. Things got worse from there. The driver of the silver car, 17-year-old Mohammed Rahim, joined the, the confrontation, and as we Weiss backed away, the two got between him and his vehicle. That's when Weiss displayed his pistol, pointing it to the ground, uh, to the side and the ground. According to Weiss, Rahim laughed and said, that's not a real gun, and then spit on him. After that, Weiss said Rahim tried to grab the gun, so he chambered around and held it at Re uh, Rahim's chest. At trial, Ducart said Ru Ra Raham's response was, do it then. Wes, Weiss, Weiss filed a single shot. We talked a little bit about the provocation, that if you are going to provocate, provoke, someone into a deadly force event to make yourself look better in, in explaining yourself, you have lost your right to self-defense. In the aftermath of the shooting, the Olmstead County Attorney's Office charged Weiss with second-degree murder. The key to the state's case would be convincing a jury that Weiss had an opportunity to leave from Ducart and Rahim aggressive behavior, but choose instead to stay and ultimately shoot Mohammed Rahim. Minnesota is a duty to treat state. Don West, National Trial Counsel for CCW Safe, and he was one of the uh, lawyers for George, Zimmer's, uh, George Zimmerman says that duty to treat law means you have to get out of there if you can without increasing your own risk of harm. If there is an avenue of escape, you have to take it before you can use deadly force. The Olmstead County attorney, Mark Olstream, said it like this. The law requires the deadly force to be employed only after attempts to avoid danger has been made and there's no other option. The clear opportunity for Weiss to get away was when he went back to his car and to get his phone and gun. Right after Ducart's first threats, Don West questions why Weiss didn't just lock himself in his car and call 911. You're pretty safe in your car, and if they don't have a weapon, he says, this is a middle of the day and where there's nothing to suggest that his car was disabled that he couldn't have just driven away at any point he wanted to. The defense argues that argued that it's illegal to leave the scene of a vehicle collision, which is true, but um, Alstern, Austern countered that we never really said he had to drive away. According to the report from the Star Tribune, 
Ostern suggests Weiss could have walked far enough away to defuse the situation while staying in the general area. It was wintertime. I don't... Wintertime in Minnesota. You're just not going to walk away from your car. Or he could have gotten in his car and called police. Instead, Ostern says he went back to his car and then came back out. And that's where things went wrong. I've given you a general overall picture of what happened that day. We had... The passenger car who got out of his car, had his shoulders up with his fist pumped, confronted him, said he was going to kill him, kill Weiss. Weiss went back to his car to get information of insurance and license plate for the, the collision, and he brought back his gun. Came back, Mohammed came out, confronted him, said that's not a real gun, went for his gun. And we'll get through some more of the facts from there. In a self-defense claim, you need up to five elements of self-defense. Innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonless. Now, one or more of those will be suspended or removed in certain situations in every state. But every state, you need to have those five considerations before your self-defense event is warranted. All right? I use this sentence all the time, and if you can remember this, you're well ahead of the game. A person who is without fault may use force, including deadly force, to defend what they reasonably fear is an imminent, unlawful threat of death or great bodily harm, provided that there is no reasonable alternative to avoid it. If you look here, I've color-coded it for you. Innocence, without fear. Eminence, eminent, unlawful threat. Proportionality may use force, including deadly force. Avoidance, no reasonable alternative to avoid it. The reasonableness, reasonable fear, and reasonable to get away. So if you guys do anything, go over this. Either le learn that sentence, a person who is without fault may use force, including deadly force, to defend what they reasonably fear is the imminent unlawful threat of death or great bodily harm, provided there is no reasonable alternative to avoid it, or just learn innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness, and then understand what that, those mean. Their first standard is the innocent standard. You must be the innocent party. You cannot be the first aggressor. Okay? Ducart, he was yelling. Weiss testified that Ducart had his shoulders up and his fist balled. Weiss told the juror that Ducart uh, accused him of causing a crash. Ducart threatened to kill him, so Weiss did not start the conflict, and he actually got out of the car to provide assistance to what he thought was a minor car accident into the ditch and got stuck, and this is what, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So, the second one, Weiss went back to a still-running car and retrieved his cell phone and took his Glock pistol from the glove compartment and slid it into his jacket pocket. Then he engaged Ducart. I believe it is a crime to leave. Weiss said in the effort to justify his choice to continue the confrontation. Now, I, I'm not exactly sure why the author said to justify his his confrontation. It would be more of not a confrontation in my mind. It would be more into collecting information for the insurance company. So I think he went back to his gun just in case of something went went south, seriously south. But I truly believe that Weiss, a basketball referee, um, is a type of person who wants to get things right. And we go from there. So, but here we go. The innocent standard. Weiss returns with the gun. So you need to decide. At that point, he could have gotten away. But he brought a gun with him. Let's continue this. The driver of the, seven, of the silver car, 17-year-old Mohammed Rahim, joined the confrontation. And as Weiss backed away, the two got uh, between him and his vehicle. That's when Weiss displayed his pistol pointing it to the side and to the ground. Or according to Weiss, Rahim laughed and said, that's not a real gun, and then spit on him. Now, we have two undersized teenagers are in his face. Is this a disparity of force? 
we're going to be talking about disparity of force once we get to that section. But here it is. He's been attacked now again with two, albeit undersized, teenagers compared to a 25-year-old man. Has he lost his innocent standard? If he has lost his innocent standard, he loses his claim to self-defense. The next standard that you're going to have to consider is imminence. Your deadly attack is happening right now. It's not some time in the past. It's not some time in the future. What eminence means is it is happening now. If you do not act now, you will be dead. All right. Part of how you decide if you are in immediate threat of death or great bodily harm is Mass Ayub has developed something called the AOJ Triad, Ability, Opportunity, and Jeopardy. And we are going to go through those right now. Does your attacker have the ability to cause death or great bodily harm? A deadly weapon, a position and advantage. Now, a position and advantage is like what happened to George Zimmerman. Trayvon Martin was on top of George Zimmerman, bashing his head into the ground. Uh, disparate if force also could be size, greater fighting ability, uh, age, what, whatever the disparity is, that could be a disparity of force. So ability goes into that. Opportunity. Does your attacker have the ability to carry out the attack with proximity? I'm going to be going over the truler drill, but I want to briefly describe what we're, what we're, we're going through. Let's just say that you were up at a park and you had somebody with a bat and is aggressive toward you. If that person is 70 yards away and screaming at you, does he have the opportunity to use that bat to bash your head? No. Now let's just say that that person is five feet from you. Now does that person have the opportunity to bash your head in? Yeah. All right. I want to talk. The Tula drill is something uh, 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 interesting. And if you don't know what the Tula drill, you need to know it now. The Tula drill is part of your subjectively reasonable person standard as far as your expertise and training where you have to prove to the court that you knew this information before you got in. It just can't be an afterthought, lawyer thought of it, and you went from there. How do you prove it? Well, if you have a book on the Tula drill, sign it and date it, all right? Something to that, to that effect. If you have a better trainer who puts you through the Tula drill, show it, okay? Now, this is a video from USCCA, and it briefly describes uh, the Tula drill. People have been asking to see the Tula drill in action. We did that in one episode of The Proving Ground, so let's take a look at what happens when Adam charges at our trainee. What are you going to do, Mike? I don't want huh? any trouble. What are you going to do? What Just are you going to do? Stay back. Just stay back. A lot of people call the Tula drill the 21-foot rule, but it's really not a hard and fast rule. This is just an opportunity for you to understand how quickly somebody can cover ground and get on top of you in a deadly incident. And it also shows how slowly you can get your gun out and put two rounds on target to try to stop this threat. That space, typically about 21 feet, sometimes 25 feet or more, gets covered very quickly, especially if you have an active, aggressive attacker. This is something you need to consider if somebody's charging at you. First thing to do is move, get off the X, and then make sure you're getting your gun into play and getting rounds on target. But honestly, this happens very, very quickly. And if you're not prepared for it, you're going to find yourself behind. Now, one, one thing about the Tula drill that is specific to you, if you are a concealed carrier, obviously you drawing your gun is going to take greater time, more than likely for most people, than one and a half seconds. So you got to figure out what is your distance with somebody that has a contact weapon like a bat, knife, crowbar, or whatever thing that can be doing great bodily injury or death, right? The next part of this equation is jeopardy. It means that the other person's action or words provided you with reasonable per, um, per, um, perceived belief 
that they intend to cause death or great bodily harm. Now, let's go through this. We're at the baseball stadium, and a person has a bat. Well, it's not unreasonable for someone to have a bat at a baseball park. Now, so does he have the ability to knock your brains out? Yeah, well, he does have a bat, but that that's all he does. Now, if he is 50 feet away, does he have an opportunity to use that bat? No. But let's say that he is five feet from you. Does he have the opportunity to use that bat? If you have those conditions, can you use deadly force at that point? Well, no. He's not showing jeopardy. So if that person walked by you within, ten, within five feet, you can't just pull out your gun and shoot him. He has to show jeopardy. How about this scenario? He is within five feet of you, swinging his bat angrily toward you, and says he's going to beat your face in. The next standard is proportional force. You can use enough force that it is reasonable to stop a deadly attack. All right. So what was, what was said? We said Rahim, uh, Rahim tried to grab the gun, so he chambered it around and held it at Rahim's chest. At trial, Ducart said Rahim's response was, Do it then. Weiss fired a single shot, if a single fatal shot. We're going to go over some Minnesota case law about proportional force. And this is from State versus Graham, uh, Minnesota appellate court, looked like. However, where the defendant is the original aggressor, self-defense will be available to him only if he actually and in good faith withdraws from the conflict and communicates the withdrawal expressly or implied. If we remember in the text, after uh, Rahim made contact with him aggressively, his words that he stepped back. And then he deployed the weapon. All right. Now, when... When case law is scarce on a certain thing, what you also will do is look for other verbiage in case law in the Sixth, in the sixth Circuit of the Federal Court. Aggressor has the duty, uh, duty to employ power to advert the necessary of killing before his right to self-defense may re be revived. He must clearly manifest a good faith intention to withdraw from the fray. Is the couple of steps backwards in anything meaning meaningful to you? Also, something out of the Iowa State Court, impossible for the defendant to communicate the withdrawal. It is an attribute to his own fault, and he must abide by the consequences. If you cannot communicate fully of your idea of withdrawal, no matter what the consequences are, you have to heed by them. So with proportional force, you got to understand, was Kyle's thought process his proportional to what he was facing to smaller underage children, uh, 17 year old teenagers, there were multiple attackers. So I know in, if you've taken a, a gun permit class, they will talk about disparity of numbers, but you're going to have to verbalize it in a coherent way while you feared for your life for great bodily harm. And if you remember in the video, Alexander was concerned about the two girls in the car attacking him, along with the two guys attacking him. A little bit more of the proportional force. Rahim joined the conf uh, confrontation. Weiss backed away. Sorry, I got a, a little bit ahead of myself. Weiss displayed his pistol. Rahim laughed and said, that's not even, even a real gun. All right. Then Rahim went on to, uh, to say, do it then. Provocation. Now let's talk a little bit about provocation. State versus love. The law does not permit or justify one who intends to commit an assault upon another to, to design and advance his own defense by instigating a quarrel or a combat with a view thereby to create a situation with, wherein 
the inflection of the intent injury will appear to have been done in self-defense. That is great lawyer speak. Lawyers and professors write for each other, and it's their own ego on display about how they can confuse it as much as possible. Basically what this is, is if you provoke somebody to do a deadly act, you lose your self-defense right. That's exactly what Raheem did. Do it then. And then Weiss fired a single shot. So again, you're looking at proportional force. Was Alexander correct in shooting Muhammad? Three, two, one. Avoidance. Avoidance is a large, large part of this scenario. Whether you are in a duty to retreat state or you are in a stay in your ground state, do not turn yourself away from this information because it is just as important in a duty in a stand your ground state because as I explained before, there are more hoops to jump through with a lot of the standard ground states, especially if it is done by statutory language, they have, have two conditions. You are in a legal place that you're allowed to be, you're not creating a crime, and other states have more conditions before you can stand your ground. So it's actually easier to know duty to retreat because if you can do it safely, you have a duty to retreat. So let's go through this one a little bit. Minnesota has recognized that a person who kills another in self-defense must have attempted to retreat if reasonably possible. The key to the state's case would be convincing a jury that Weiss had had the opportunity to flee Ducart and Rahim's aggressive behavior, but chose in, instead to stay and ultimately shoot Muhammad Rahim. The clear opportunity for Weiss to get away was when he backed uh, he went back to his car to get his a phone and gun, right after Ducart's first threats. The defense argued that the it's illegal to leave the scene of a vehicle collision. I'm going to go over this a little bit. There is something called the doctrine of necessity. The doctrine of necessity will alleviate small laws to have a greater good. It's, the thing is also called the lesser of two evils, okay? So if, if there is a greater good to get away and create a crime of leaving a, a scene of an accident, well, then that's something that you should do. When you are in a self-defense event, or if you ever become in a self-defense event, it is a paramount to understand that if you can get away, but you have to trespass... Don't worry about the trespass. That will be explained away by your lawyer in the doctrine of necessity. All right? We never really said he had to drive away. According to the report from the Star Tribune, Austin suggests Weiss could have walked far enough away to defuse the situation while staying in the general area, or he could gotten in his car and called the police. Instead, Ostrom says he went back to his car and then came back out. That's where what things went wrong. So now you have to decide for yourself if walking, you know, the law doesn't require you to do something that is impossible. I don't, you know, Southern Minnesota is cold. Walking away that day may have not been a, a, a very good option. I mean, you're supposed to stay out of your car for a little bit in, in January in the, in the state of Minnesota. I'm not exactly sure if that is a reasonable choice, okay? So you have to uh, uh, to decide. Did Alexander Weiss have the opportunity of avoidance? Was it reasonable to leave the, the first incident, go to his car, get his phone, and his gun and come back to possibly get information for insurance information because of the accident before Raheem came out and tried to grab the gun. The last standard that we really need to consider is reasonableness. Weiss did not require to make a perfect decision. He only needs to make reasonable decisions. When it comes to self-defense, you don't have to do it perfect. 
the only requirement is that your actions were reasonable, all right? I want you guys to, to decide. You have good enough information to conclude what you would consider as a 2020 hindsight on what this case would be. And after I give you this jury instruction, I want you to pause the video, put your comment in there, and briefly describe why. All right? This is a Minnesota jury instruction, 7.05. No crime is committed when a person attempts to take the life of another person, even intentionally, if defendant's action is taken in resisting or preventing an offense which defend, the defendant reasonably believe exposure defendant or another to death or great bodily harm. If the defendant's action is taken in preventing the commission of a felony of assault in the second degree or assault in the third degree in the defendant's place of abode, that wouldn't apply here. There are some, what the, the main big hang up what Minnesota has is that last place, uh, that last few uh, words, place of abode. Courts have ruled that this is also outside the abode. In order for the killing to be justified for this reason, three conditions must be met. First, the defendant's action must have been done in the belief that it was necessary to avoid death or great bodily harm. Second, the judgment and the defendant as to the gravity of the peril to which he or another was exposed must have been reasonable under the circumstances. Third, the defendant's um, election to defend must have been such as a reasonable person would have made in light of the danger perceived and the existence of the alternative way of avoiding the peril. All three conditions must be met, but the state has the burden of pr uh, proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act in self-defense. Go ahead and pause it. In about five seconds, I will give you the conclusion video, news video of this case. Five, four, three, two, one. The murder charge against a Rochester man accused of shooting and killing a 17 year old is dismissed. Alexander Weiss has been the subject of two mistrials for the shooting death of Muhammad Rahim after a traffic crash confrontation last year. Tonight we're getting reaction from Weiss's defense attorney. But first, KTDC's Linda Ha joins us live in the studio. Linda, it's been a month since the second mistrial. So what comes next? Caitlin, after the last hung jury, we've been anxiously waiting to learn whether prosecutors will announce a third trial. The Olmstead County Attorney's Office announced today that without a unanimous verdict in sight, that won't happen. Alexander Weiss pleaded not guilty to second degree murder in connection to the shooting death of Muhammad Rahim, arguing he shot the 17 year old in self defense. The key question in the case, whether Mr. Weiss exhausted all reasonable options before using deadly force. Two trials and two deadlock juries later, the Olmstead County attorney is dismissing the murder charge. It doesn't mean that Mr. Weiss is not guilty. That, that is not, a, not at all what it means. In fact, um, based on the two jury trials, we know that there were a number of people on those juries that did believe that Mr. Weiss was guilty. It's just a reality that we are not going to get a unanimous verdict in this case. County Attorney Mark Ostrom's decision comes after weeks of reviewing the case, speaking with Raheem's family, jurors, and hearing public input. Those were really difficult conversations you can imagine. He says justice has not been served. Uh, they lost a loved one. They lost a 17-year-old family member, son. And as much as he believes Weiss should be convicted, moving forward with another trial would be unethical. A loss of life out of something as simple as that should never have occurred. According to Weiss's defense attorney, the weeks leading up to this announcement have been difficult. He's been anxious. He said he's had good days and bad. Um, I think it's the unknown that's uh, the worst, you know, not knowing what's going to happen. So he, he sounded extremely relieved. And there's no doubt the incident and the case have been life changing. And the fact that the case was dismissed won't probably disassociate his name, you know, with this homicide. So uh, I don't know what Alex's plans are short term or long term. I know he thought about moving. This case is tragic. 
and the fact that the case was dismissed doesn't make it any less tragic for everybody. McGinney says the most recent jury split was eight to four in favor of not guilty. Now there's no law that bars prosecution of the case in the future, but that is unlikely. Live in the newsroom, Linda Ha, KTTC News.